Hello, Herondalians. On behalf of the session of HPC and in the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to our virtual worship service for August the 30th, 2020. I have some prayer requests. My neighbor, Sue Spencer, is going to have her hip replaced on September 26th. She's in a lot of pain. Please pray for Sue. Mitzi Bowers requests prayers for Jay Orbell. He has heart problems. And Jay used to do yard work for Mitzi. So pray for Jay. Kathy Mann, gallbladder surgery on the 27th. Pray for Kathy. I received a phone call today from Dorothy Ramsey. She said Imogene Rogers has some good news. Her daughter Pamela gave birth to a girl named Sadie and her granddaughter Stephanie had a girl named Vanessa. Congratulations. Now beginning today, I'm going to announce birthdays. So if you have your pencil and paper handy or whatever you have, you may write these down and send them a card. September 1st, Jonas Nicholson. By the way, it's my son-in-law, so send him a birthday card, not a sympathy card. On the third is Kathy Mann. The fourth, Wes Garrett. The fourth also, Janet Gender. And on the fifth, Richard Elliott. Now let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Stand with me as we're called into worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he has uttered. He sent his service, servant Moses and Aaron, whom he had chosen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Let us draw near to God, confessing our sins to the one who is loving enough and powerful enough to take them away. Let us pray silently, confessing how we have failed to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves. And then together, using the prayer printed on your sheet, let us pray. Hear our silent prayers, O Lord, and hear us now as we pray together. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength through Jesus Christ, your Son. Hear now the good news. In Christ we are forgiven. In Christ we are forgiven forever and ever. Amen. Now, please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise to hymn 337, we will glorify. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Roman Church, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Listen for God's word. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, 
Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. second reading and the text for the sermon comes from Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 15. Another familiar story of Moses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. And then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. And then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt, I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, 
And this is my title for all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have noticed that over the last few months, I have in my sermons alluded to the divisions and divisiveness in our nation these days. Well, this morning I want to do a little more than allude to it. This morning I want to go deep. I want to go deeper, to be quite honest, than I've ever dared to go on this subject, but I think it's time. And that said, I want to assure you of something. I will not try to influence how you vote, to what candidate or political party that you adhere to. It's not that I don't have a dog in this fight. Of course I do. We all do. But it would just be wrong for me to try to influence you. It would be a grievous abuse of my position as your pastor. So I have no intention, no intention of doing this. Besides, it's illegal, just in case you weren't aware of that. So... When November rolls around, you vote your conscience. And don't even ask me how I voted, and I won't ask you either. I'm a big proponent of the secret ballot. But the truth of the matter is, with the national conventions now behind us and the debates coming, things are going to heat up. And they're going to get uglier, if that's even possible, as we draw near to the election. And these same divides, these same divisive ideas and positions that we see in government and politics, well, you can't avoid the fact that they end up landing in the church as well. Now, we don't have a two-party system in the PCUSA governmental, governmental structure, but we sure do have in this denomination both liberals and conservatives. In church speak, we refer to them as progressives and evangelicals. And in church policy and theological focus, the divide usually falls along the focus on social justice issues on the progressive or liberal side and the personal relationship with Jesus and winning souls to Christ on the evangelical and conservative side. Now, I know, I know that all of you all know this. This is, this is no news for you. But, but I want to be very clear about what I'm talking about this morning. I don't want anybody to think that I'm being secular and political when I'm doing my very best to be theological and biblical. Okay? So if you get to the end of this sermon and you still feel like I'm trying to influence how you vote, well... I would ask that you would hit the replay button and watch it again. That's one of the wonders of virtual worship. You can do that. Or better yet, email me or pick up the phone and call me, and we'll work this out together if you really and truly think that's what I'm trying to do. All right, let's get on with it. Let's start start with the liberal side. Let's start with the progressives in this ecclesiastical divide that we find ourselves in these days. Truth is, truth is, these progressives that, uh, that like to focus on social justice issues, I, I would challenge any of us, I would challenge all of us to go to the Bible, read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and come away thinking that God, in his law and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, cares nothing wants to have nothing to do with social justice issues. I challenge you to do that. I I cannot imagine reading the Bible and not coming away from it knowing that God cares about things like poverty, that God wants us to treat each other with respect and equality regardless, regardless of differences in culture, of differences in ethnicity, in social status, in in anything. God wants us to treat each other fairly, to treat each other fairly. You can't turn the page of the Bible without 
being told to care for widows and orphans, being told to welcome the stranger into your home, to turn the other cheek, even go so far as to love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That is radical social justice by anyone's book. And the truth is, I would hold up the Judeo-Christian approach to social justice issues against any worldview on the planet, secular or religious. And I believe we would come out at the top when it comes to being equitable and compassionate. Christianity is unapologetically promotion of love and acceptance for all humanity. In other words, social justice. But here, here's the danger. Here's where I think things begin to go wrong with, with this social justice approach. As long as social justice comments stay, or, or concepts, excuse me, stay within the realm of person to person, as long as they are relational, things seem to follow a pretty spiritual path. It's when, it's when we get away from that that things start to go awry. Even, even if we act out these Christian social justice principles on a little bit bigger scale with small groups like families and communities and churches, it still, it still works well. In fact, it still works amazingly well at that stage of the game. I would even go so far as to say supernaturally well. It's almost as if Jesus himself shows up whenever two or three are gathered. When things remain on the personal, the relational level, they seem to stay fairly consistent with the scriptural view of social justice behavior. It's when we shift from the personal to the institutional that something begins to happen. When we are no longer interacting as a Christian with another human being, but instead pitting Christianity as a system against another system that we think is unjust, well, then the scriptural setting begins to fade and disappear. And, and what replaces it, I am afraid, is more is more humanistic than godly. We begin to strategize. We begin to conceive plans. We map out programs to attack the injustice. We wage war on institutions and systems we perceive to be unjust and wrong, even evil. And I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I am not saying that systems and institutions cannot be wrong and even evil. Of course they can be. History is rife with organizations that have been evil. And I'm not saying that we should not fight against them. We should. I'm not even suggesting that if, if social justice issues get on too large a scale, that the Holy Spirit can no longer work at that level. I'm not saying that. Jesus himself, Jesus himself fed up to 5,000 people at times doesn't have to be one on one it's just that it's just that when we Christians move beyond the relational and we begin to operate organizationally then certain temptations begin to arise we begin to shift our focus away from the work of the Holy Spirit and we begin to look at logistics of how to battle systems and institutions. It's very, very easy to get caught up in our own human work at that point. In fact, it, it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between God's work and our personal sense of what we think is just. Maybe another way to put this is you can love another human being. You can even love a a family or a church or a community, a, a small group. But it is really hard to love a system or an institution. And if we are Christian, we have to act with love every time we address social justice issues. 
If our very identity as Christians becomes defined by, by what we can accomplish, when, it, when our identity as a Christian becomes about, about our focus on social justice issues, then it's really no longer Christian. At that point, at that point, we are fundamentally no different than a good secular humanist. You know, secular humanists hate injustice. They will, they hate it with all their heart. They will do everything they can to eliminate injustice at any cost. Good-hearted people. But they don't believe in Jesus. And that, in my book, is a huge difference. So that's the danger. That's the danger of moving too far with this progressiveness, with this, with this social justice liberalism. So, how much hot water am I in so far? Let's move to the other side. Let's, let's go forward and let's take a look at the conservative approach to Christianity, the evangelical approach. Let's look at this focus on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and the winning of souls. Now, Scripture... Scripture says about as clear as anything can be said that if you're going to claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you must believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. Now that, by definition, is a personal relationship. To call someone your Lord has to be personal. can't be anything else. And actually, that was the very first creed of Christianity. Before all the other creeds, before the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, every other creed, the very first creed in Christianity was simply Jesus is Lord. So that's about as foundational as you can get, this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, it's all about believing and then living into that belief. And if Jesus is our Lord, and we believe and take seriously these foundational beliefs of Christianity, the truths of Christianity, then I would think it would be very natural that we would want to share this with other people. In fact, we would want everyone to at least know about these truths, especially, especially if we believe that there are consequences to not believing, that there is actually danger, eternal danger, to not accepting these foundational truths. It's like if you believe in gravity and you have a friend who doesn't and they decide that they're going to jump off a bridge because they can believe they can fly, then, then you would do everything you could to prevent them from doing that, right? I don't mean to be simplistic. I don't mean to, to be childish with this. But the fact of the matter is, being a Christian, claiming Jesus as Lord, is more than a personal choice. That belief, that claim has concrete consequences. It's important. But here's, here's the danger on the evangelical side. Here's where things start to go wrong evangelicals, because they're all about making sure everybody knows the gospel, evangelicals love to go big. I mean, think about it. All the mega churches, all the big box churches, they, the biggest churches in this nation are evangelical because they love to go big. They have developed ways and formulas and systems that will reach thousands, even millions of people. And I think that's wonderful. Getting the gospel out there like that is absolutely wonderful. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, he preached to thousands of people and ended up bringing 3,000 to repentance and baptism. So the Holy Spirit can operate on a big, grand, large scale. Absolutely. It's just that when Christians move beyond the personal and begin to operate organizationally, there are temptations that begin to arise. You know, we begin to shift our focus from the work of the Holy Spirit 
the work that, that we can see up close and personal, to the logistics of how to win as many souls as possible, how to get as many people in church as possible. And, and it's very, very easy to get all caught up in the human work that we're doing. In fact, it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between the work God is doing and our own accomplishments, our, our own personal sense of success. We can get lost in all the technology, in the marketing, in the production value, in the entertainment appeal. We can get lost in all of those things. And if our very identity as Christians, if how we define ourselves as Christians is only by what we can accomplish, if it's only about a focus on statistics and numbers, well, it's really not Christianity anymore at that point. Because at that point, we're fundamentally no different than a corporation, okay? Corporations can do amazing things. They can, they can accomplish things that change the world we live in change the lives we live, but they don't believe in Jesus. And in my book, that's a really big difference. So that's the danger. That's the danger for evangelicals. So where does all this leave us? And maybe more to the point, what on earth does any of this have to do with Moses and the burning bush? You all remember Moses in the burning bush, the scripture that we read this morning, the text for the sermon. What in the world does all of this, this have to do with that? Well, the truth of the matter is all of, all of these divisions between liberal and conservative and evangelical and progressive, uh, all of this has everything to do with Moses in the burning bush because what we're really talking about is a sense of call. Who do we and where do we believe God is calling us? All of this, all of this is about sensing our call. But what if there's a third way? What if there's another way to look at this? What if instead of defining our Christian identity, our call as a follower of Christ, by terms like progressive or evangelical or or conservative or liberal, what if we started with something that goes a little deeper, that's a little more solid? You know, when Moses received his call from God, the foundation of that call lay in something that was absolutely immovable. When God spoke out of the burning bush, God did not say, my name is I am against the Egyptians. God did not say, my name is, I am for the Israelites. God said, my name is, I am that I am. I am that I am. God, by God's very nature, by the very being, is simply and purely is. God is is and out of that I amness comes all the for and against but it comes out of it it is not the origin of it the for and against don't define God it's not God's identity I am that I am even the bush even the bush is burning without consuming or destroying it is out of the isness of the bush that comes heat and light. I understand this is a difficult concept. It is for me at least. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around all of this. But, but here's the deal. If you define yourself, if you define your very being as a human being, your very nature by being against something or even for something, then you are dependent on that something for your identity. You see what I mean? Like if I define myself, if I define who Edwin Lacey is, my very existence as being against the New England Patriots, 
then I am now dependent on the New England Patriots for my existence. If they don't exist, then I don't exist because my existence is being against them. You see what I mean? You see where I'm going? God can't do that. God cannot do that. Even if God defined God's self as being against something as basic as evil, it still means that from that definition, God is dependent on the existence of evil. It's like light and dark. Darkness is, by definition, the absence of light. That's all it is. Dark can only exist because of light. Light, however, is its own thing. We're not completely sure what it is, but it is something that exists. It is not the absence of darkness in the way that darkness is the absence of light. Light just is. And so I think as Christians, we need to think deeply and prayerfully before we start identifying ourselves as called to be conservative or liberal, as called to be progressives against social injustice or evangelicals for the winning of souls. That is not necessarily the best place to start. I believe like Moses, our sense of call should originate with the irreducible nature of God, the I am that I am. Because if that's where we start, then we can safely go wherever God leads us from that point. God called Moses to a very specific and concrete task. God called Moses to get the Israelites out of Egypt and lead them to the promised land. That's specific. It's concrete. But that assignment, that mission, that task is not the origin of Moses' call. I am that I am was the origin of the call. And it should be for each of us as well. The only way I know, the only way I know to establish I am that I am as the starting point of who we are as Christians, of our call, is with the great commandment. You remember the great commandment, chapter 22 of Matthew? They asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus answers right away, right out of the Old Testament. And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's where we have to start. That's where we can truly find I am that I am if we start by loving God, not by fighting social injustice in the world and not by trying to win as many souls for Christ as we can, but by loving God. If our very nature, if our identity as a Christian is loving God with all our hearts and souls and minds, with all our all, then we have begun with something that is immovable, irreducible, solid. And when we have completed the first part of that commandment, when we have gotten to the point that we love God with that level of entirety, then and only then can we move to the second part of the commandment and begin to love our neighbors as ourselves. Because how can we love our neighbors if we don't first love God? The source of love is God. God is love. That's where it all comes from. We can't love anyone, not really, without first loving God. And so simply put, in order to love our neighbors, we must first love God. To do otherwise is impossible. And how do we love God in such an all-encompassing and self-defining way? How do, we, how do we grow into the love that will eventually lead us to being able to love our neighbors in ways that, that will treat them with fairness? And we'll encourage them to come to a relationship with Jesus Christ. How do we start doing that? 
by spending time in Scripture and in prayer. A great deal more time in Scripture and prayer than most of us, myself included, now spend. In fact, a lot more than we think is even possible given our busy lives. More time, to be perfectly frank, than most of us are willing to spend. Time in Scripture and in prayer. But I warn you, and I warn myself, if we turn spending time in Scripture and prayer into a human act, into something that we do because it accomplishes something that we want, if we go down that road, and we can, if we go down that road, we're right back in that danger area that we were talking about earlier, and it's no longer Christianity, it's just another human endeavor. We have to spend our time in Scripture and prayer out of a heart filled with love for God. Maybe it's fragile love. Maybe, maybe it's just little fledgling love, just beginning love, but love nevertheless. I truly believe, I truly believe that if we start as Christians with loving God, just as simple as that and just as difficult as that, if we, if we start, if we hear our call out of that heart fire of I am that I am, then all of these divisions between differing Christian views will simply melt away. Now, it will not be some idealistic utopia. That's always a human pipe dream. We will still maintain differences in opinions, in understandings, in approaches, in interpretations. Those differences will always exist between us, but they will be held in love and respect. They will be treated with kindness and gentleness. We can love God and our neighbors. Friends, we must love God and our neighbors. Conservative, liberal, progressive, evangelical, love. I am that I am. Amen. Changeless it shall stand, deep writ upon the human heart, unseen. You have eternal life implanted in the soul. Your love shall be strength and stay while ages 
Jesus rule. We praise you, living God. We praise your holy name, who was and is and is to be forever saved. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We trust in God whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. Let us go to God in prayer. God of power and love, you raised Jesus from death to life, resplendent in glory to rule over all creation. Free the world to rejoice in his peace, to glory in his justice, and to live in his love. Unite all humankind in Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. We lift up these prayers in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please sing with me as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn 559, Here I Am, Lord. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go. the Lord of snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They I turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will 
If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of wind and flame, I will tend the poor and lame. I will set a feast for them. My hand will save. Mine is bread I will provide. Till their hearts be satisfied. I will give my life to them. Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it Receive now the benediction. May the Lord watch between me and thee when we are absent, one from the other. <laughs>